This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. And we're now live. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm here to talk about the cello in the symphony orchestra. Um, a lot of time is spent, uh, of course, you know, talking about preparing for auditions, which of course is enormously important uh, because of the challenges that uh, go along with, with taking auditions. Um, but I wanted to talk today more about actually playing in a symphony orchestra and the roles that the cello plays in the symphony orchestra because um, I don't often hear so many things about that. And I think it's really important because it's, there are uh, you know, distinct differences um, in terms of playing in a symphony orchestra versus you know, playing your solo pieces or chamber music or, um, or using the cello in other ways. And so um, I thought I'd start by talking about, first of all, where the cello lies in the overall sound spectrum of a symphony orchestra. Um, you know, all of the instruments in a symphony orchestra were uh, developed and invented with the idea of emulating the human voice historically in Western art music. And so um, uh, you can think of the instruments as uh, being part of the vocal spectrum. And so, like, for example, if we take a string section, uh, we have the first violins, second violins, the violas, the cellos, and the double basses. And if we assign those general registers uh, to uh, a string section, uh, or, or you compare it to um, the vocal registers, you have uh, the sopranos, which are the first violins, the mezzo-sopranos, which are the second violins, the altos, which are the violas, the tenors, which are the cellos, and the basses, which are the double basses. Now, that is not to say that these instruments are limited to those registers. Of course, um, uh, most instruments can play in registers outside of the ones I just you know, assigned, like, for example, to a string. However, with that being said, uh, the great composers chose to write uh, for these instruments in what I would call the sweet spots of those instruments, which is the registers of each instrument that sounds the best. Um, you, for the cello, of course, that probably means uh, the A string from, say, you know, uh, middle C uh, going up a, a, an octave and a half or so. And so that's and because of, uh, of course, the physics of that and, and how the instrument uh, resonates you know, with, with the A string there. And so um, then we should also be thinking about the other instruments in a symphony orchestra and the uh, general sweet spots for those instruments. And so we have, um, you know, for the sopranos, we'll call them the sopranos that play with the first violins. Uh, similar instruments uh, to the first violins would include the flutes, the clarinets, the trumpets, the oboes. And then when we're looking at uh, the same register as the mezzo-sopranos, the second violins, then we're talking about basically the same instruments, uh, but with the second and third lines written for those instruments. So functioning similarly to a string section, because of course, second violins, are still violins. They're just playing in the lower registers or lower registers to the first violins. And then we take the violas um, and the other instruments in an orchestra that tend to be in that alto range would include the English horn and the French horn. Um, and then when we're looking at the cellos and the tenors, uh, you also have the horns too, and, and often again, probably second, third horn. Um, we're looking at now the bassoons. Uh, there's a lot of writing that we have in common with the bassoons, as well as the horns. Um, and then we're looking at um, Oh, and then, of course, the trombones, too, are in our register. Um, and then when you look at the double basses, now we're talking about the bass clarinet, the contrabassoon, and the tuba. And so th those are the, the instruments. Uh, composers generally tried to stay in these registers, or if, if they didn't stay there, they wrote uh, you know, largely in those ranges for these instruments. 
And the reason it's important to know those things is um, when you're, for example, if you're sharing a line with another uh, group of instruments in a symphony orchestra, uh, a lot of times you're going to be playing with, as a cellist, you're going to be playing with the bassoons, you're going to be playing with the horns, you're going to be playing with the trombones. Um, it's also important to know what everyone else is doing because then when you have counterpoint uh, and you hear a soprano line, well, it's probably going to be played by first or second violins, it's going to be played by the oboes, flutes, you know, those high wind brass instruments. So, um, and it's, and it's interesting, of course, because then as we move forward uh, in time uh, into, you know, say the 20th century and beyond in, in classical music, then uh, composers exper experiment much more with uh, using uh, instruments in non-conventional registers to produce different colors, different sounds, uh, different effects overall, and, and even uh, use instruments completely differently than they were traditionally used. So um, anyway, that kind of gives you an overview of the range of the sound spectrum of a symphony orchestra and where the cello lies. Uh, now I would like to talk about the musical roles of the cello um, in terms of how the composers, uh, the great composers, uh, use the cello and, and what kind of roles they assign to the cello in a symphony orchestra. Um, first, I'd like to talk about just the timbre of the cello. Of course, we know as cellists, uh, the cello is most famous for having a very soulful sound, warm, uh, very poignant, um, and also uh, highly expressive. It, it, it lies in the registers that uh, actually cover almost the entire spectrum of the human voice. It, it's uh, an instrument that uh, has one of the largest ranges of any instrument. It, I think it's also very much one of the most colorful instruments because of the variety of sounds that it can produce. So, um, which leads me to the second um, aspect of the cello. First, we're talking about the timbre, but the cello's versatility. And uh, it's just such a versatile instrument and um, it also uh, is a, can be a, a relatively agile instrument. And of course, a cello is not as agile as a violin or some of the smaller instruments, but uh, for a larger instrument, it's quite agile. And that is supported, of course, by the fact it's probably the number three, well, it's not probably, it is the third most popular solo instrument uh, with guest soloists, the symphony orchestras. And I think there are good reasons for that. Um, and so now we are talking about uh, the functionality of the cello. Um, so we talked about the timbre, the versatility. Um, so now how did the great composers use the cello? Well, I already uh, alluded and spoke briefly about it, but um, if you are thinking about um, the, the cello as a solo instrument, it, it is one of the best solo instruments um, in a symphony orchestra because of its capacity for singing soaring melodies and very expressive solos. Um, and because of, of course, we talked about the color and, and the range that the instrument offers. Um, so uh, a lot of the great composers wrote uh, beautiful uh, melodies for the cello all over the symphonic repertoire. Another use uh, and very important role of the cello in the symphony orchestra is bass lines. And the cellos as a section uh, they lead the bass line. Um, and the reason they're the leaders is because they're the closest uh, group of musicians to the podium. And so the other instruments in their register uh, can watch them and see them versus the cellos themselves. Uh, you know, you can't see what the bassoons are doing. You can't see what the trombones are doing without turning around. And that doesn't really work. Um, and so it, uh, the cellos are, are very important in terms of laying down the bass line and deciding uh, how the music is going to go from the bass line perspective. Um, and a third way the great composers use the cello is for uh, rhythm. And if you think about it, uh, if you look at the, the bookends of a string section, you have on the highest end the first violins. And on the lowest end, you have the double basses. And from that uh, perspective, the cellos become an inner voice. So sometimes they end up doing what uh, the, the sections that are more considered regularly inner voices do, which is the second violins and particularly the violas, uh, in playing 
offbeats, syncopated rhythms, or, or just yeah, rhythmic figures that uh, have that motoric or a rhythmic aspect to the, the tapestry. And so composers, uh, because of the versatility, they, they wrote for the cello that way too. Now, so um, I wanted to take some examples, uh, excerpts from the symphony orchestra literature and see if this is really true, what I just said. So we're going to go look at a couple composers, play a few excerpts um, and examine and see if what I'm telling you is true or if I'm just making stuff up uh, just for, yeah, just to, to entertain you. So let's take a look. Um, I'm gonna go get my cello here and we're gonna start uh, with Beethoven V, an excerpt that I'm sure none of you have ever heard before. Um, the second movement of the Fifth Symphony, um, the opening. Let's just look at that for a second, the, the famous theme that we all know. <laughs> a beautiful melody and I just said exactly how Beethoven used the cello there with the viols as a melodic instrument so this is an example of how um, you know the beautiful uh, melodic qualities that the cello possesses um, now we're gonna look a little bit further into that movement a line that is usually not an excerpt uh, it's not particularly technically difficult, but there are things when executing it you have to think about. Um, I'll just play it first, and those of you who know the symphony will know immediately where it is, and those of you who don't know the symphony as well might not know where it is or what's going on in the music at that point. few notes would give it away. So, and for those of you who don't know it, um, I suppose I don't have to play them all by memory, but um, so now you get the, you, you today you have the privilege of hearing my singing. So if I sing along with that, I'll start a couple bars early and just make up the whole phrase. La -da -da. So anyway, um, so then you, now you see, yeah, that's the bass line, right? It's the harmonic underpinning of the violin's uh, suspended melody over there. So that's clearly a bass line there with its, you know, the harmonic implications. Now we look, I thought it was interesting, we can go to the corresponding spot uh, before variation two, which is uh, the transition again back. We have this, you know, cyclical sort of rondo sonata form in this movement. Um, and look what Beethoven does here. Should I sing? Okay, sure. La -da -da. see there's clearly uh, an obsessive motoric figure in Pianissa. So there the cello functions both as the baseline harmonic underpinnings of the music and uh, a rhythmic propulsion in Pianissimo and creating this you know extra tension and suspense. So there is an example where he used the cello for two 
uh, reasons uh, at the same time. This will become a theme as we look at the other Xers because in my investigations I found as we move through the 19th century to into the 20th century that more and more as the music becomes more complex, it wouldn't be surprising that the excerpts serve multiple purposes at the same time. So let's move to the, the next of the three Bs, uh, Johannes Brahms, his Symphony Number no. 4, which is, uh, you know, such an interesting piece. Um, you know, have to look far to find interest here. But if we look at the opening, so, of course, this is the cello line here. <laughs> I would, you know, that's my first impression. I think, you know, the harmonies are rich. It's very apparent. However, it also creates a current through the arpeggiation under, the, of course, the melody. And so on. So, um, yeah, it's, it serves two purposes. It, it, immediately, there's this searching quality and, and in Brahms, E minor is always a, a mysterious and, and searching key. Now, uh, right where I stopped, if we just look at letter A, the next thing, um, he wrote this for the cellos. <laughs> Baseline and again rhythm, so it's it's the offbeat character uh, that again uh, is most often uh, you know, traditionally used in inner voices. So again, we have multiple forces at work. Now, if we go to C in this first movement of the Fourth Symphony, um, you see, of course, uh, Brahms didn't forget that the cello is a marvelous uh, melodic instrument. <laughs> so many examples of uh, the cello strictly uh, carrying one role at a time. It's, it seems to be multiple, often two functions at the same time. Now let's go ahead in history to uh, Richard Strauss. Um, we look at his famous tone poem, Ein Heldleben, and of course we all know the beginning goes like this. <laughs> singing, soaring, doing what the cello does best at the beginning. However, what I find is interesting is, of course, we start this and you know, playing with the horn, uh, but then the violins come in, and now we're in the world of light motif. So they play melodic figures as well, and together it creates a sort of counterpoint. Well, not actually a sort of, it creates counterpoint. But uh, this counterpoint... Um, then suddenly the cello line is, so I'm going, um, and then we have, and it gets the line, da -da 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 -da. and then we're, we're under them, so we are uh, a, a 
contrapuntal line and then thus a bass line. And at the same time, when he brings these 16th notes, those, uh, then there's a rhythmic component. So actually this opening within a very short period of time is doing all three things at the same time. Now, uh, Strauss being such a, uh, you know, it's just such a colorful and, and inventive and imaginative composer, he does on occasion use the cellos just for one of those functions. So if we go to the Festus Seitmas, uh, it's somewhere in here, but anyway, I don't need to use it. It goes like this. Which begins the section, which is, of course, the call to war. And so, the, and you're playing, who are you playing with? The snare drum. So obviously that is a very rhythmic uh, aspect of the music. And I don't really think it serves much other purpose. Yeah, of course, okay, it establishes the harmony, it's not exclusive, but we can say it's primarily a rhythmic uh, figure. And now if we look forward again in this piece, do we get to the part that is expressed in peace? Um, we have this uh, thing where the cello are divided into four parts. Um, sorry, I can't play them all at the same time. Now, at the top line, um, it goes like this. Uh, okay, I'll put my mute on. I'll be a diligent musician and follow the direction. Here we go. So, and what's interesting here is we have voices two and three making uh, chords underneath and moving in thirds and sixths in relation to the top line. And so, you know, that certainly what I played has a melodic aspect to it. It also, uh, because of the divisi then, is very harmonic and those uh, sextuplets respond to the harp. Da, 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 di, da. Like this, and so it's it's also has a dialogue aspect, um, and then you could it's also rhythmic because th that creates this sort of gentle breeze that suddenly appears when uh, the war music dies down, or uh, well, yeah, and, and, and there's a section in between too, but but anyway, so um, so now you, you see again, it, there's it's more complex. There, uh, the composer is using uh, the cello to serve three functions at the same time, a cello section, because of course you have a lot of players that you can divide and, and uh, utilize that way as well. And now let's go uh, into the very early 20th century and look at the famous uh, another tone poem, this by a uh, French composer. Uh, we've been heavily in Germanic music and now this is the music of Claude Debussy, uh, his famed tone poem, La Mer. Um, if you've ever played La Mer, heard La Mer, um, or practiced, you know, in, uh, for certain the excerpt, you know, for the famous excerpt that's on most audition lists, um, it might be interesting to know that in bar three of La Mer, the cellos come in. <laughs> that when you get two measures before number nine and play there it is again so it's again Debbie likes to poo-poo you know Beethoven and his mo developing his motives well maybe you did a little bit too uh, so there it's motivic and a little bit melodic and now for number one of course there's this the coming down in the string section, this mysterious music and the cellos join. So that 
that's clearly a baseline, but I would also argue there's not much else going on there, and um, it has a melodic component. Okay, it's primarily a baseline, uh, granted. Um, so he uses it that way. And then uh, soon after, in the uh, modere section here, when he goes into 6-8, uh, uh, there are these ostinatos, inside-outside, the top line plays. <laughs> Side plays. Uh, and that definitely has, um, this is, you know, like like currents running in, in water, and you have, um, and also um, it's a, the underpinning harmonic, D flat major, um, and you could even say it's slightly melodic. So again, um, complexity as we head um, through a musical time. And then of course, you, know, you all know the famous excerpts, but what's, um, what's interesting here, you know, when we play it as an excerpt, we always just play the top line because that's what's asked for. But as you know, if you've ever looked at the music at all, it's a four part divisi, right? And everybody's playing the same rhythms together in very sensual and beautiful and, and harmonically interesting uh, chords made up of four voices. So you have a bass line in, from you know, cello four, the fourth part. You have mel melody, certainly with cello one, and, and then the inner voice is working at the same time. So you have uh, bass line, melody, and then not uh, rhythm too, as he uses the dee dum ba da 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 dee dum ba da So that's, that's, you know, it has a, a rhythmic, uh, gives the music the feel. Um, if I play, um, you get the pits there. Um, so you can see it's, there's it's serving all three functions at the same time. So. It's, this was a, an interesting little study uh, just to see how uh, the great composers use the cello uh, certainly for its melodic beauty, for its bass line uh, capabilities, harmonic implications, the color the instrument has to offer, and then also for rhythmic reasons because uh, although rhythm isn't probably the number one thing that string players are best at, um, it's, it's very possible and, um, ca and you know, capable to make this a, a great source of rhythm. So um, now I would like to talk to you a little bit about the skill needed to play in a, in a, a symphony orchestra. And it's interesting because it's so easy for a musician to, uh, or even for musicians themselves, to start labeling uh, somebody, okay, you're an orchestra player, that means you play in time, you, you, everything is correct, and it's not so creative, but it's very functional, and you create the sounds needed. And, okay, and then now you're a soloist, oh, you're a big sound, and you're good at projecting the self and all that, but maybe you're not as good at, at uh, you know, finesse or ensemble playing. And then maybe you're a chamber musician, and maybe you have an amazing uh, uh, you know, ensemble playing and, and, uh, and dialogue, but, but then you're labeled as not having the big sound or soloist abilities, or maybe not orchestral. You know what? The real truth is you need all of them for everything, and at the highest level, it's not that different. Because you should, if you're in an orchestra, you, you, you need, as a cellist, you need soloist capabilities, because where do you play most of the time? In halls of 1,500 people or more. And so if you want anyone to hear you, you have to be able to project the sound. And of course, at the same time, and then you need chamber music skills because if you play only with a distinctive uh, voice for yourself, then it's not going to necessarily uh, blend with a section. And then um, we'll get to that uh, later about um, about you know, knowing your role within a section. So, um, but chamber music skills are one of the greatest foundations of ensemble playing. Period. It doesn't matter what you're doing, and so um, it's. That it's so important in a symphony orchestra to, to know how to re uh, play dialogue, or respond to somebody else, uh, play together with somebody else, articulate, anticipate together, all those things. 
that are necessary in chamber music. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, at the highest level, and that's why when people used to ask me, well, what do you, how, how should I play my excerpts? I used to say, play it like a piece of music. Why? Because at the highest level, all of these things are needed and including interpretive skills. It doesn't matter if you're principal of a section, in the middle of a section, in the, in the back of the section. Of course, you have to be on the same page with what's going on and what's being asked and directed, but you still need to interpret the music when you play or else you won't be expressing anything. You'll just be laying down notes, which um, of course it's good to be accurate too, but, um, but there is more available. And so uh, when we try to be expressive. Um, so anyway, um, so I, that's, okay, so that's what I was talking about. What's the same? Well, the same aspects in the symphony orchestra is that music. And so you have to do all the things that you have to do um, in any other music you play, which means, you know, play in tune, play a great sound, uh, have great rhythm, uh, articulations, dynamics, colors, interpretation, right? And then what's different in a symphony orchestra? Well, What's different, uh, there's a number of things that's different. For, first of all, it's a lot more complex because in uh, most orchestras you have 80 to 110 people on stage at the same time. So that in itself is very complicated. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, you have a conductor, right? If you play other types of music and you're not in an orchestra, there's normally not a conductor unless it's maybe a contemporary music ensemble. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but there is a conductor. And so that's one thing. So you need, and then what else? There's a concert master. Well, maybe that's not so different than watching the first violinist in a string quartet or the lead violinist in a chamber music group. There's a lot of the same things that, that they're responsible for. However, uh, the concert, you, the difference in an orchestra is you'll, you'll probably be you know, farther away and that's something I'm gonna get to too. Um, and then what else is different? Um, let's see, you have, uh, oh yeah, of course, in your section, you have a section leader, right? The principal, so you have to, there's that. And so I always say that in an orchestra, you need to have one eye on the conductor, one eye on the concert master, one eye on your section leader, and then also be playing with your stand partner and another eye on the music. So I guess you need four eyes and sensory on top of that. Um, but, but in reality, of course, you can't do that, right? So, so there are different at different points. You focus on more on one of those or two of those aspects at a time, um, and that's why you have to be really well prepared to be in an orchestra and know your part because you're not playing on your time; you're playing on the group's time, and that's harder to do than just play, you know, what you feel at the moment, you know, because you can't always do that in orchestra <laughs> or in any group really. I mean, you have to it's because it's a makes the group better and offering the group what it needs to get the best at every given moment. And so, um, so you have that. And then um, I mentioned it, uh, I think the real other, uh, what makes orchestra different is the distances. The distances uh, can be incredibly far. You can be playing with somebody 30, even 40 feet away. And so what does that mean? It means that there has to be uh, different amounts of anticipation according to where you're sitting. It, well, you know, I, I play principal cello in Cleveland, so um, I probably have one of the easiest seats in the whole orchestra because because this is where all the sounds converge and the conductor's there. So what I hear is actually you know the right time of everything. But as you head back in the orchestra and get farther and farther away, what they're hearing back there is often later than how it's sounding at the front. So sometimes. They have to go against their intuitions and play earlier than it actually um, than it, than they would if they were just listening, and and that's that I can I can't imagine that must be incredibly difficult. I've I've done it a few times, sat back there for different things. It, it is a lot harder, and and then back there you also don't hear the group as well because the instruments are pointed out into the hall, of course, and so for a symphony orchestra to actually sound perfectly together everyone is playing at a slightly different time actually uh, which is an incredible you know phenomenon that that has to happen in order for it to sound together so but this is a, a skill and and um and so that's why um you have to you have to know and then also the acoustical environment will affect this too because some halls actually there isn't 
so much of a lag time in the back. And then in other halls, it can be extreme where they really have to play really ahead because they hear things so late. So it just depends on the acoustics too. So, um, um, and so now, so that's kind of, um, yeah, that, that's, those, that's what makes an orchestra different. And now I want to talk about actually how to play in an orchestra. And of course, I think I already touched on that in terms of distances. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, yeah, first and foremost, obviously, um, you need to have an eye on the conductor and it's also helpful to let them know that they have your eyes because it tends to make them feel better from the podium to, that they know that you are attentive and know what's going on. So it's always a good idea to, to let the conductor know that you're watching and then to be watching so that you're cued into what's going on. Um, so I would say, Watching the conductor and also, I mean, obviously listening. And, and sometimes if a conductor conducts really far ahead of the orchestra, or so, as an example, you need to really then tune into to the listening to the group and, and watching various section leaders while uh, taking in that information, understanding that if you play exactly with the baton, you're gonna be super early. Um, and I just use that as, a, as a, an example. Some, some conductors, um, they might conduct a little behind. Well, that's a harder one because you can't really be ahead. So then it, it's just gonna be slower or it's not as moving. So, so that, that. Um, so, so you, have to, you have to be aware. But anyway, um, it's always important to interpret, be able to interpret what uh, the conductor's doing. And, to, and if you're not listening, if you're not joining what you're, and, and to know what to listen to when too is really important because, and that's why we go back to the beginning of this talk where I'm talking about uh, the, the range and the, the different register of, uh, registers of instruments. Uh, yeah, so you, how your line plays off other lines and the musical function of what you're playing, you need to know that at all times because otherwise you don't know really what you're doing. Um, and nobody likes that feeling. <laughs> and so, so it's very important. Um, I would say also very important to make a stand. What does that mean? I don't mean, you know, bring your welding skills to, to the, the hall. Uh, what I'm talking about is really building a unit with the person you, set, you sit next to in a section. And, um, and what does that mean? Okay, you have an inside player and an outside playing player. Okay, technically, you give the edge to the outside player in terms of, uh, if, if it's say it's in the middle of a section, well, what is your role? Your job is to communicate what the front stand is doing and how they're laying down the, the musical line to the people sitting behind you. So you have, they have to uh, be leading with the front stand and show it and so to help the people behind. And then the outside person probably should have the edge over the inside person in deciding exactly where that goes. That doesn't mean the inside person should sit back and just kind of watch, And because if you sit back, you're late. And then you, so in other words, every person in a section has to lead. We have to do it together. We have to feel the group pulse together and, and, and be really tuned in. If you're at the back of a section, that's the hardest place. It's the hardest place to hear. So those people are often watching the bow of the principal, or if you, maybe if you can't see that, the bow of the, the, uh, the associate or assistant principal who's sitting next, so they can see where it's, where it's happening. And then they're watching, they're relying a lot on the motions of the front desk as well as the uh, conductor, of course. So they, because back there, it's, it's, it's really a different world that's, that's, uh, from my experiences. And, and it's very challenging. And I really admire the people who sit far away from the podium and and time are able to play in, 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 in with such wonderful timing and anticipation because it's just really hard to do. But but like anything, you get good at it. You get used to your neighborhood, and that brings uh, another thing about playing in orchestra. Get to know your neighborhood. No, no. Of course, you're going to build a stand with your stand partner. You'll have conversations in the gaps. Time you get to know them personally a little bit. Uh, very importantly, get to know their playing, but also. You know, if you say you're on, if you sit where the cello sit in Cleveland, which is American string quartet uh, seating, and if you're on the outside sitting back, then you might be sitting next to a violist. Well, get to know how the violas make music. If you're a little further back, you'll be close to the double basses, and and the, you get to know how they 
how they play. And, and of course, it's helpful too. It's a nice, uh, the human aspect, who they are as people, because um, sounding good and, and being together with your neighborhood is a very satisfying experience. And sometimes, even when things aren't perfect to, perfectly together around the orchestra, it can be satisfying that you, you, your neighborhood is kind of rocking and playing great together. I mean, this is really uh, a wonderful thing. And so, and I think uh, that also translates then to a large area being together. And so, so that's important. Um, I already talked about knowing your function uh, in terms of the musical line. Should talk a little bit about the function of, of um, uh, within the section. Well, I guess I, I kind of touched on that too, didn't I? But uh, still, it's, it's um, you, your role is, is so important. And, and I didn't talk about how, um, you know, let's say you're on the front desk, a principal and associate or assistant principal. Um, let's say that um, the music calls for something uh, uh, very, uh, well, just like, uh, like in, the, in the distance, something happening, you know, suspense, drama, or, or something far away you're hearing. Well, then perhaps the balance of your section should be, the front desk should be the quietest, and the most sound should be made by the people in the back, because then it's going to sound like it's farther away. Unlike if the music is a little more outgoing and say the opening of Heldenleben or something, well then the front desk should really lead that because the music is here and now and we're all projecting outward. And um, so that's kind of fun too in, in a section if you can kind of play with that. And of course, I think conductors are largely responsible for that, but, um, but the members of a, a section can also take it uh, upon themselves to, to do these things. and. Um, I know I'm very lucky in Cleveland because, uh, you know, like when I first joined the section and I do something, I was like, ooh, uh, you know, sports car, power steering, everything I do, uh, uh, every, everybody's right with me like this. And, um, and so that was pretty fun and, and a great orchestra like the one I play in. Um, so, so anyway, and, and this is, um, I think if you, if you can, as, a, as an orchestra member, if you can find a way and take pride in trying to give the group what it needs, when it needs. Uh, that has a certain satisfaction for sure, but also if you can still find a way that you can be you in the group too and achieve these things. So you, you have both, uh, you feel like you have your own, um, you know, uh, can express yourself and don't have to sort of try to fit in all the time. Um, uh, so if you can achieve both of those, then you can have a very happy life in this and I know it's there's a symphony orchestra is complicated and it's not always easy to to you know satisfy every desire that everybody might have. But I think the overall impact, you know, and and, and how good the, the product is at the end, if it's a if it's an excellent product, you know, there's a great satisfaction in that no matter what. So, um, so um, you know, the only other thing I thought I'd do before I take some questions is. Um, I thought it might like show an example of, well, I don't know if it's so much, like I said, if you play chamber music or, or you are a solo player or whatever, you need, um, well, you need, let's put it this way, artistically, you're gonna be on the highest level if you employ all the skills needed for all of these things to whatever you're doing, because your music's gonna be that much better. Um, whether or not the audience picks up on it, well, you know, there are some artistic things that are more for us uh, because one thing for sure uh, is that charisma uh, kind of trumps everything. So if you're charismatic, that, that connects with people and because that's a really human thing. However, I do believe if the music is greater, somehow that translates the message. People feel something. They feel, uh, more, they feel more moved, put it that way. Um, and, and so that's so I do think these things are important. So, but anyway, I, what I can show is like let's just say take the trio from Beethoven Five. So what if I play? <laughs> people think you need to do in an orchestra audition. You're putting a really good rhythm, generally really in tune, 
pretty good sound, you know, all that stuff. It's all good and in time, whatever character is fine. But it's, you know, that would you play your sonata that way? Probably not. Would you play a concerto that way? I don't think so. Because, and the reason is because I didn't really um, use my body in a way that uh, communicates and shows people uh, what the musical feeling is. And, and also there wasn't a lot of musical feeling there, let's face it. Uh, it. It was kind of kind of mechanical because people, you know, what happens when we prepare exits is we're so caught up in trying to, you know, play perfectly and, and play perfectly in time and, and all the, check all the boxes, but we forget it's music. And I can promise you that since I've been here, nobody has been hired at the Cleveland Orchestra that checked all the boxes and played like that. No. And, and that, that's like, and for my, you know, for, for us, for our, our music director, that's like the kiss of death. I mean, it's like, it's, it's just nothing. It's not a, because you know why? There's no real musical value there. It's just, it's, it's good playing and stops there. And that's it. And so we, what we want to try to do is express what this music's about. So, well, it's C major and it's, you know, it's, it's foreshadowing the great last movement. I mean, it's the key of C major, the key of salvation. It's, it's, it, there's something incredibly triumphant over, you know, which is, becomes then a theme for the whole 19th century about, uh, you know, overcoming uh, heroic struggle. And I think that's in contemporary life, that's why this music is still very relevant because every day there's so many, com there's so much complexity in life and, and we all have our personal struggles, we have our society struggles that we have to overcome and, and rise above. And that's why this music is just so, and Beethoven in particular, just so relevant today to, to you know, just to everybody. Um, so, so then if I play, for example, and then towards the end it sounded even better because I released my forearm a little bit more. And of course, if I wasn't going blah, blah so much that I would be more focused on those things. So anyway, um, but you can see at least what I did it, it much more resembled music, and I think there was, an, uh, you know, some sort of exuberance, and there was, you know, some gesture and, and some movement, so that people behind me have an I can at least uh, not only see what I'm doing, but they can, you know, feel what I'm doing. And I think it, it's the it's the sixth sense that uh, makes a great performer. How you sense the other people. You know, the first time I ever played in the music Brian in Vienna. It was, it was uncanny because in that hall, when I was playing, it's like the stage, it just, you could just feel where everybody was. And I mean, you could, you could feel the, the, the sounds moving around. It, it was the most uh, amazing thing. And I've, I've never quite experienced that quite like that in any other hall. And, and it just really uh, amplified what I'm talking about is this, to really, the sense of, of who you're playing with and, and you know, when you're really in harmony and in the group with other people, they're, that, they're, that's one of the great feelings you can have in, in ensemble playing. It's just, is you're doing it together. It's, you know, if you're related to sports, it's a team sport, right? It's, and and we're, we're as great as the sum of all of our parts. And when those parts are employed in the best possible way for the group, then, then great things can be achieved. And, and so that's, um, to me, probably the most rewarding thing about ensemble playing. And um, I remind myself often when I go to work how privileged I am to hear the quality of playing that I hear all over the Cleveland Orchestra every day uh, from the solo players to every uh, you know section player. We, we have amazing section players. We have, we have section players that could be principal in many orchestras. Um, and there, it's just, it's, um, and, and you, you, you take one of us out and you plug someone else in, it's, it's always a great orchestra. It's an, it's an, it's a stunning, some of my best experiences have actually been where I'm not playing and I get to devote all of my attention to listening and watching the orchestra from the outside and just admire how great it is. So anyway, um, so anyway, that's, that's just my, uh, good fortune and, um, I get to hear and, and uh, be a part of that. So right now, I think I would like to take some questions. It's a good time for questions. And I'm sure there's plenty of things on my phone coming 
from everybody watching and listening today. Um, so let's see. Uh, Questions for today. What is the first thing you do on the cello every day? Um, honestly, sometimes it's play orchestra because I don't always, I'm not the earliest riser in the world. Uh, you know, concerts tend to be in the evening and then things after it takes time to wind down. And so sometimes, you know, it's just warming up just a little bit and starting an orchestra. I, I actually like that because if I go to a 10 a.m. rehearsal, and even if I'm not completely warmed up, I think it's great practice for those times when you, you have to perform a concert and for this reason or that, you couldn't be warmed up because then it's not going to be such a shock when you actually... And of course, um, I'll do my practicing later, um, and I tend to uh, yeah, do more as the day goes on, and I'm a little bit of a night owl, so that's... That's, um, but, but if you mean practicing, hmm, I, I, I think there's, sometimes it'll be a scale, sometimes it'll be music. I think it's important to approach music from all angles and different angles and not practice the same all the time because we all fall into those, that habit, and I do too, um, and I have to remind myself that there are different ways to practice, and if you're not practicing different ways, and it's too much the same, uh, you're kind of creating your musical life from uh, a, a certain dimension and then um, it, yeah, you're kind of limiting uh, the, the total, the, what the possibilities are. Um, how can one gain a better understanding of the large musical uh, context surrounding orchestral excerpts? Well, that's, okay, fair question. Uh, study the music and um, if you're not a great score reader, the, I mean, the, the first thing I would say is find a great recording, not so if you're preparing for the Philadelphia Orchestra, I don't recommend listening to a high school orchestra on YouTube because that's not going to give you all the information you need. What I think you should do is find a great recording of you know a, a, an orchestra of that you know of that quality with a great conductor and just open get a score, IMSLP or Dover or 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 if you can if you're if you can get a, uh, authoritative uh, score, even better, um, and follow along, listen and see. And then what I would also say is um, um, it's, it's helpful to listen to set different recordings because you can see different interpretations. But then once you kind of figure out the approach that you want to take, then you may end up focusing more on a certain one just that, that is more along the lines what you're trying to do, but just just so you can hear all the, the parts simultaneously. I mean, I, there's, there has to be, uh, well, yeah, it's, well, yeah, there does, ha there has to be uh, a fair amount of work done away from your instrument. And, and that's also helpful if you're playing a concerto, if you're playing chamber music, because uh, when you, you know, when we're playing, a lot of our energy, or at least a good part of it, has to go into playing. And so you can't give everything your full attention, but from the outside, you can focus all your powers on just music, and, and a lot of times it's about getting in your ear and figuring, just figuring out what you, you want to and what you need to be doing. And then if you pick up your instrument, you can save a lot of time because you know what you're looking for. And a lot of times when we're struggling practicing, it's because we haven't quite figured out what we're trying to do. And um, so that, that can save time too, and, and in addition to um, you know helping you learn. And then also learning how to read a score, so then once you have these you've listened to the piece a lot, then, then maybe you can pick up a score and hear it when you look at it, an orchestral score and kind of do that. So good question. Um, in your mind, what, what is it that makes an effective practice session? Well, it's kind of uh, what I just said, you know, knowing what you're doing. I would say setting a goal for the day. Like so many people say, uh, how many hours should you practice? Well, um, that depends. I think it depends on how long it takes to reach your goal for the day. Of course, you don't want to set goals that are impossible to reach, or you'll be practicing 24 hours in a day. Um, but but you want to, yeah, just set a, set out a goal for the day, and you might be done in 10 minutes, you might be done in half an hour, you might be done in four hours. So, it, you know, it, and of course, um, maybe that's helpful if you have a, a busy schedule, 
of so many other things you're doing in your life. But nevertheless, I just think having something to focus on. So this is what I'm trying. And maybe you didn't totally reach the goal, but you. What's important is you made progress towards that goal. And so I think goal-oriented practice and kind of deciding ahead of time, uh, at least just generally. I mean, I, you don't have to say 20 minutes of this and 30 of that because I mean that can be and it create depending on who you are, but that it might make you feel rigid if you do that. Um, so, so I think just just have, have setting for yourself uh, a focus for that practice session. Uh, how do you simultaneously, wait, how do you stimulate creativity and imagination in the practice room? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think it's about having ideas. And sometimes, honestly, you might sit there and not have any ideas and not feel inspired. But what I've found in the past is sometimes it doesn't take very much. You might... You know, just go to the computer and Google something, pick up a, a book. It's, it's just sometimes you'll just read something that just or, about, or or something about the music you're playing or about the time period or, or something like this that just somehow uh, stimulates thought and, and sparks your imagination. So it's about if you're not inspired, figure out a way to get inspired because it, it really sometimes doesn't take much, but we just have to get our mind and our thinking in the right place, and that can open the door. Same t technique can be inspiring because you you found something uh, that helped you break through a problem, and then and then you were able to um, overcome. And then suddenly something becomes easy that was hard before. Uh, it says, how do you manage lots of repertoire at the same time? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think. Not procrastinating and planning ahead is always a good idea. I mean, in reality, sometimes what happens is maybe you aren't procrastinating, but maybe your your life is just busy, and in the end, a lot of times what happens is you end up just doing the next thing. But then, if right, if if you don't have enough time for the next thing, then uh, planning ahead really becomes critical, be, so that you have done some of the work ahead of time. And I think. It gets better with age, but I think even with age, you have to be mindful of these things because, yeah, when you're really busy, things creep up on you. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I've got such and such a few days from now and I haven't had enough time to practice. And it happens to everybody, of course. I mean, there's, nobody can do everything, you know, prepared perfectly all the time. However, you can minimize these things by being a good planner and always thinking ahead. I think every day when I get up, I, I try to lay out some goals for the day and I also look at my calendar often and things that are coming up and I think are important to prepare for. I'm always looking and say, okay, that's there. Okay, I know. Okay, I better start that. You know, so I, I try, you know, and I'm not, not always perfect, but I, um, but I, I think this, I, I do really try to do that and it helps a lot. Um, how does one balance between projection and showcasing the ability to blend within a section in an orchestral audition? Well, that is a very interesting and a very good question. Um, yeah, I guess it's a, it would be about, I mean, you could, you know, you could go about it a lot of different ways. I mean, if, if something is more strident and outgoing, you might really, you know, from an expressive point of view, you might really show that in the audition. And then when it's pianissimo, you might really show that. Or maybe you find a way to, to project, you know, actually, uh, Here's an, uh, an interesting idea. There's the idea of projection in pianissimo, so like piano. So with, that's not so loud what I just did, but it's distinctive and it has you know very uh, it's a, a specific character, a specific sound to show. I think the main thing in an audition versus uh, actually playing in a section would be playing with distinction because when you're sitting there alone, you have to be a little more distinctive. It doesn't mean you have to razor sharp edges to every note you play. Sometimes you want really soft, but just to play with distinct character and distinct expression, which might mean, um, uh, I mean, it is true at times when you're playing soft in orchestra, I mean, you don't play with much, uh, at times, maybe not a lot of uh, core or definition that way. So you always have to have a little more core or definition in the audition, but that doesn't mean you know, da, it doesn't mean like, you know, something so obvious and, and right here and, you know, it can be uh, 
you know, the most gentle and, and uh, caressing thing, but just, just with presence, just so there's a, and so that there's a center to the sound can still be airy or soft, but just not, which actually you might play if you're in a section to blend and just to play soft enough at certain times with so many other people. So that's, I think that would be the difference there. Um, when you're a section player and you can't see the principle, do you follow the associate principle? Well, the first thing you should do probably is try to position yourself so you can see the principle, which is often possible. But if you really can't, then yeah, I would say, and I think I might've even said that in the talk, uh, to try to then, yeah, see the, what the, uh, the, the associate uh, principle is, oh, is doing uh, in, in their movements, right? That's, that would be a good solution. How many hours a day should one practice? Quality or quantity? Definitely quality. I've had students that practice 10 hours and then I'm thinking to myself, that's all you got done. And, and then I figure out that they weren't practicing very efficiently. And so, I mean, I think even 15 minutes of, of superb practicing is better than two hours of unfocused practice because in a way you're practicing, if you're unfocused, plain unfocused. And as we know, that does not lead to the greatest results. Um, how do you think about having a cohesive section sound that is beautiful and contributing to the sound of the whole orchestra. Do you speak with your colleagues about this or do you do it by how you play? You know, in the Cleveland Orchestra, most, most of what happens is by the unsaid. It's, it's, it's mainly by doing and not by talking. Um, and I mean, of course, there is some talking, but, um, but I would say more than probably most orchestras, it, it's really, I ha I've had a substitute come here once uh, years ago and she said to me afterwards she says it's, it's amazing how many things are going on here that aren't talked about and and that's really that is that but it's and things that were even learned by not talking i'm not saying that's the best way to you know to, for these things never to be talked about i mean i think it's helpful if they are talked about and i've actually learned a lot about how people are thinking by teaching alongside them especially when we you know say the principals go to uh, do a coaching session with the, the orchestra at New World or the University of Colorado or you know some of the places we, we go to work with uh, student orchestras or in the New World's case, the fellows, you know, they're, they're not students anymore. But, um, but just, uh, so it's, it, um, and, and in practice, I think it's better if you can show, same with conductors. If any conductor is watching, please show more than talking because you can save a lot of time, and I think the overall uh, the overall uh, results will be better. That doesn't mean it's not important to be able to uh, verbalize, but I mean if you're mainly talking and not showing, that doesn't go as far from my experience. But uh, so um, anyway, so that that's um, on that. Um, but I, and beautiful sound. Um, you know, I think orchestra playing has changed to some extent. I think in the past, um, conductors usually always wanted a beautiful sound from the orchestra. I think now uh, they sometimes want a beautiful sound. Sometimes they, depending on what you, you know, a lot of modern pieces, they don't want a beautiful sound. They want to express something else. And so, um, but I do think in terms of quality, some, you know, a, a good amount of time needs to be spent cultivating beauty because, you know, Let's face it, I think people want to hear that and I think people need beauty to hear beauty and to experience beauty in their lives when there are so many other challenging things that everyone has to go through all the time. So, um, so yeah, so what we spend, you know, and with our current music director, uh, he always wants a qualitative sound and most of the time a beautiful sound. So, um, so yeah, this is always, uh, it's, it's a culture here. Um, okay. And then you've played a lot of great music in the orchestral repertoire. Do you have any favorite symphonies that you never get tired of playing? Well, and I'll start with the Beethoven symphonies. Uh, in 2018, we toured with uh, these symphonies uh, and played them all three times, Cleveland, Vienna, and Tokyo, and also played a couple overtures, most of Fugue, uh, and I think even a, a one, one, in one place, a piano overture. By the time I was in Tokyo, which is where we ended, I, I was like, I could continue playing this music indefinitely because there's so much variety and so much, the, the full range of human expression found in these symphonies. It's like, I just never got tired of it. And, and it's, it's always so inspiring. So, I mean, yeah, you start with Beethoven, 
Brahms 4, we're going to play it in a few weeks. We haven't actually played it in a long time, believe it or not, because we have such a far-reaching and wide repertoire in Cleveland, but what, what, an, incredible, what incredible music. Um, uh, there are some modern pieces that I've really enjoyed uh, playing, and, and I, I am a proponent. I think modern music is important. It's a, it's a, very, it's a reflection of, of the here and now, and we need to hear that in our concert halls. Um, and I would say to any composer that might be listening today, my, my only request is think of the strings as a body of the instrument and not just some background texture for the rest of the orchestra, because um, I think we can do more than that, in other words. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that sometimes. I think that we, we want to feature the incredible playing and the winds, brass, and but I just think we shouldn't be just only doing that because if you look through the, the music of the past uh, the great composers thought more or that we could do more so and we're happy to do more we're, we're, we're very amicable people so um, good very good um, and what did I press so we need to go here we go um, another thing could you talk about how you prepare a concert program every week what was your process like when you first started um, well I think and then uh, what else? And hadn't learned all the orchestral repertoire. Well, it's it's a lot more challenging to um, to play when every week there is a piece coming that you haven't played. I feel fortunate because I played a lot of orchestral music when I was younger. Uh, Aspen Music Festival, Indiana University had five orchestras, so we played orchestra every week. And then I went out to, to make some extra money and put in some of the regional orchestras. Um, so I, it was incredible, actually, the, the amount of repertoire that I went through there, Aspen, nine weeks of summer for four summers, um, and Juilliard Orchestra. And so when I uh, started my first orchestra job in Germany, I was going, you know, there still was quite a bit of music I hadn't played, but I, I kept playing pieces like, oh, I just saw how valuable these early experiences with this music was because I wasn't starting from zero. Like with every piece, I, I already knew it to some extent and, and it was on a certain level and then a place to depart from. So if it's a new piece, it's harder. You have to, because you have to start. And another, the hardest thing is a new piece by a composer you've never experienced before because then you have nothing to go by. And so then it's, you're just starting to figure out pieces and, you know, how it's, and, and you know, studying scores and, um, learning your part, being able to play the notes, saying, oh, that looks like that, and uh, similar type music, same markings and tempo and character, oh, this is different, and, and this kind of thing. And so that, that takes extra time. And then when you kind of figure it out, uh, then it's more, then you're more on the, the regular preparation process, um, which is, I, I think, always uh, trying to figure out what the music is about. And don't worry about playing perfectly, but just... Get, get the right kind of, or what you think is the right feel for it and, and interpretive things. And then you can go to the, the polishing, you know, which is where you're really taking things apart and, and going into details, how, how to best execute and play, not only securely, but yeah, with a, with a great degree of polish. And then the final step, step would be practicing actually performing it, able to, to not be thinking A and B and, and so that you're playing it like the first time you, you read it in the music, you're just making music, right? You're just playing, oh, my left hand goes here and now my right hand here and, and my foot goes there and no, no it's not, not that because that, that doesn't lead to good results. Um, so, so, and, and so I would say if it's a piece I know and have played a lot of times, I probably would just, you know, think about it, uh, be thinking about it, looking at the music, and then um, I will, you know, just start playing it and then see how it sounds and then figure out what I need to do to make it, you know, better. So, and that, that's a lot easier because at least you're starting at a high level. Like if I pull out Beethoven 5, well, I've played that a few times by now. So, and, and know something about it, hopefully. Uh, so, so, so that a good question. Um, okay, I think that may... Have gone through all the questions for this uh, cello chat, and so if there aren't any more questions for me right now, I want to thank everybody for watching and listening today, and I hope this uh, gave you some uh, ideas and things to think about walking away when um, you were thinking about 
learned how to play in symphony orchestra, whether you're doing it for the first time or whether you're already a seasoned orchestra player and are looking to sort of up your game and be a better orchestral musician.